Welcome everyone to this uh, to, to this session um, where we're going to be talking about axions and primordial black holes. And I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, um, which is Javi Redondo. Go, go ahead, Javi. Very well. So I'm uh, <clears throat> sorry. I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, wonderful conference. Actually, I'm enjoying myself very much. The, the talks that I can follow because I, I'm not always here and I'm hidden under this uh, retonto name. Um, so thank you very much organizers. Uh, thank you very much uh, Dodi for the introduction. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, action dark matter substructure uh, in a very um, partial way. So uh, I will tell you a small story. <laughs> I will not, I cannot, tell, uh, cannot talk about all the uh, aspects of action dark matter substructure that I would really love, which are many. But actually, <clears throat> I will greatly benefit from the lectures that um, uh, Dodi uh, made the previous days. He already introduced many of the concepts that I will be using. So I think uh, this will allow me to go a little bit further and become uh, slightly more technical. So um, yeah, what you see here in my, in my first slide is just a, a, a picture of a density map of a action dark matter simulation in the early universe and uh, color coded by density. This is just a two dimensional slice. And you see <clears throat> that indeed action dark matter looks uh, at least at very small uh, scales, looks very different to the typical pictures of action dark matter visualizations that you, you could have uh, had uh, before because it has these wavy patterns, okay? That will play uh, some role uh, in, the, in, in the coming. So let's go. So. Just uh, to start, let me just tell you that, uh, so what's the spirit of this talk is just to point that action dark matter is different. Now you know all that. And I want to focus on some particular aspects, which is that uh, action dark matter can have uh, very different substructure properties, okay? Uh, and uh, therefore purely gravitational tests of, of dark matter could provide us with smoking guns to the nature of dark matter, could tell us whether dark matter is made of actions or not. And the top, this topic is absolutely vast and uh, very nicely covered already by uh, Dodi in his lectures. So I will just be focusing on the, on the um, particular case I've been working in the last few years, which is the QCD axiom. And actually I will focus even more. I will focus on the post-inflationary scenario uh, with uh, N equals one. So with uh, one uh, vacuum, so uh, just no degenerate back here. For the, uh, for the axion, because in this case, we can just make uh, quantitative predictions. In particular, <clears throat> my, my most uh, loved aspect of this scenario is that in principle, is that in principle, we could actually compute the amount of action dark matter produced in the early universe. Uh, and therefore, uh, well, as the function of FA, the, the action decay constant or the action mass in vacuum, which are related, and therefore we can just make the prediction or we, can, we could just invert this function and tells us, tell us uh, what is the action mass for which we would get from the early universe all the dark matter, uh, all the dark matter that we observe, right? Uh, and uh, so this has been done. Of course, this is slightly complicated. One needs numerical simulations to do this, as you know very well, uh, to deal with the uh, cosmic string uh, network in particular. Uh, and this has led to different estimates in the literature. The most recent here are, um, uh, they, they lie in this range of 15 microelectron volt to uh, something over 500 microelectron volt uh, using different techniques to solve the most important problems or the dynamical range problem of the simulations. Uh, so this, clear, this clearly, um, states that we, we have to really put more, more work into these uh, calculations and we are, we are doing that. But for the moment being, <clears throat> we have a relatively narrow, uh, essentially slightly more than one order of magnitude uncertainty in this, in this estimate, which is already quite good. This points to a, a energy scale, uh, action decay constant of 10 to the 10 uh, GeV, 10 to the 11 GeV that we have to, that we will have in mind for the rest of the talk. So um, the dark matter <clears throat> uh, history line in this post-inflationary scenario has been sketched by, or has been described by, uh, by Dodd in his lectures, but I, I want to here to put a, a sketch of the storyline so that you can see actually that there are 
pretty interesting uh, um, substructures appearing in the history of action dark matter. So this is a, a cartoon of the history of the evolution of the universe from inflation until today. And it follows the most important uh, time epochs in the history of, of the axion uh, dark matter field. So at, the begin, so at the beginning, we might have inflation or we might not. But we, in this scenario, what we assume is that uh, there's a Pacheco-in phase transition after inflation or uh, at some point, uh, which in this case could uh, correspond to redshift of 10 to the 25 or so. And in this case, so after this transition, we have the QCD action. And uh, we have a, a, a network of cosmic strings, topological so defects, because the, cost, the QCD action is just uh, an angular field. So you can have accidental uh, uh, windings <clears throat> in the distribution that actually you know, form these uh, global strings. And these global strings, they, they follow a scaling regime, more or less in which the, the number of scale uh, of strings or the length of strings per Hubble volume uh, is more or less constant or is, is increasing very slowly. Uh, and uh, this continues until the uh, more or less times of the, around the QCD phase transition when the axion mass becomes uh, significant, significant uh, to tilt the Mexican hat potential and to favor one value of the, of the theta field, the, the, uh, the axion field, which is theta equals zero. At that time, <coughs> the, all the field tends to go to, uh, to zero and uh, strings are pulled by the main walls uh, and uh, get all destroyed. And you get a, a non, essentially a normal atavistic field plus uh, some uh, accidents that we will uh, briefly describe. These are agents of a, of a character, interesting character, characters in this history. Uh, there are <coughs> these little dots in this uh, density picture that tend to appear slightly after the accents have become non-relativistic. And, um, but they last uh, essentially until uh, the uh, topological susceptibility or the accent mass becomes constant and uh, then more or less they radiate away. And then from that moment on, the accent dark matter is more or less frozen, uh, but for a small free streaming until uh, <clears throat> the universe becomes matter dominated and uh, the small well, or the order one inhomogeneities in the action field that have uh, ensued from uh, the mm, different values of theta produced in the scaling regime uh, in different places of the universe uh, can collapse gravitationally. So gravity becomes important here and produce a small, a very small scale um, um, dark matter halos that we call mini clusters, action mini clusters. And then um, this form very fast around matter radiation equality. And then from matter radiation equality, they, they suffer hierarchical formation and they form clusters of mini clusters until <clears throat> today in which we would have that the galactic halo is just made of um, mini clusters, clusters of mini clusters and some few axions that were not clustered in between, okay? Uh, so this is the storyline, and we, we we have had uh, three elements of substru substructure which are extremely interesting. The first one are the cosmic strings, already introduced by Dolly, and uh, the key uh, the key aspects of this uh, particular substructure is that uh, cosmic strings they produce axions. Uh, here you have a cartoon um, that also has been introduced by Dolly, uh, in which I have a two dimensional slice of the axion field uh, here expressed as a as an angle theta and color coded, theta equals zero is black, theta equals pi or minus pi is, is white. And uh, cosmic strings are just these points in which uh, theta wants, has to take all the values. And um, what you see here is that, um, for instance, when, when uh, these cosmic strings collapse, they indeed uh, radi produce axions that are radiated. Look at this, for instance, at this case. So this would be a small loop uh, that uh, has collapsed and is producing an action wave or wave that propagates in this color uh, coded theta. Um, <clears throat> the problem with this uh, uh, simul or the, uh, the, the, um, the important scale for these uh, cosmic strings is just the action decay constant. So these, these objects are extremely tiny. So the typical 
thickness of the core of the string is just one over F8, more or less, while typically the distance between these strings is uh, the Hubble um, horizon, so essentially time, and increases with time. So the, very soon, uh, this, uh, the evolution of these strings cannot be followed numerically because we cannot have enough uh, dynamical range to simulate these things. Um, so these are going to be very important to determine the action in dark matter. Uh, spectrum, uh, when the action becomes non-relativistic and thus dark matter. And something very interesting uh, that uh, we knew some time ago, but has been recently pointed out is that these uh, cosmic strings have some interesting properties in principle are color and, and, um, and charge superconducting because they couple two fields that can, can have color and charge. Um, or so let's say that the, the um, scalar field that has to, well, at least in the case we see model and, and similar, but I think in all of an anomaly and solve the strong CP problem. And therefore uh, at the center of this, and the center of these strings where the, this field takes uh, the value of zero in order to regularize the uh, infinite energy of, of the gradients of the cosmic string. Um, these, these part, also particles that couple to this field, they will have actually uh, zero mass unless they, they, get, they have mass from other, uh, from other fields, in which case that they are not useful for the, kit, for the solution of the strong CP problem, they have other problems. So this, um, quarks, these heavy quarks, actually, they can have, they can propagate at the speed of light inside of these strings, and they can, uh, um, they can stay there for, um, for a long time, uh, producing vortons and other issues that change uh, the phenomenology very much, but they have not been very, uh, very much studied until very recently. Also, something very interesting is that if you couple this uh, complex scalar that, that regularizes the strings, uh, to lepton number, as, as we did in the uh, SMASH model, for instance, um, <clears throat> you can actually store bright hat neutrinos in these strings and produce uh, leptogenesis uh, in this scenario as well. This has been studied. But I'm not going to talk very much about this. Just, I'm just telling you what are the, main, the most important things about cosmic strings in this scenario. Uh, the next element of uh, substructure, of action substructure, are these axitons. Uh, which are also sometimes have to be discussed with um, dense action stars and dilute action stars. Oh my God, I'm going too slow. So um, accidents uh, are just, um, uh, so the breathers of the action field in the early universe, and they, uh, they have, so they, they, they consist of an, an action field lump uh, of uh, theta order one, that is oscillating and radiating some relativistic actions. But in the early universe, because the action mass increases with time uh, during the, our simulations, for instance, these accidents, they decrease and they typically percolate. Um, and these accidents are very nasty because they dominate the power spectrum I will, I will tell you about. But it can be very interesting because they can provide very high density uh, seeds. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, when the the action mass becomes constant. Is it po is possible to also to have pseudo breathers? And these uh, objects are uh, unstable. And one can also build uh, non relativistic configurations uh, that are um, mm, non relativistic configurations that last a little bit longer so that they don't decay with a rate which is essentially the action mass, but a little bit longer but it's extremely complicated to, to produce these objects in the universe. The typical dilute ax or dense action star, uh, which are stars that in the, in the radius versus uh, mass plane would be in this line, uh, these, these guys, they don't form. Only the typical uh, dilute action star forms uh, with, a, with the radius inverse of the action mass typically, which is an, in a sense is the densest of the accidents. So accidents are here, uh, they, they would move, move here as the action mass decreases and uh, dilute action stars are here, but these are largely irrelevant. And the third thing is the dilute action star, which is a, a very similar uh, uh, concept. It's just an oscilloton. And so it's a, uh, um, a coherent lump of axions, but are, which are gravitationally bound. And these objects are much larger and they can be formed in the interior of, of action mini clusters and so on. These guys, they, they live here. Okay, and they are a result of gravitational uh, formation 
um, of gravitational um, the, so they are stabilized by gravity against uh, gravitation uh, gravity against a gradient pressure and these are uh, very fascinating objects uh, but they, they don't like to show up in the QCD accent case uh, however if they are here they can accrete so there's a, a maximum mass that these objects can have so if they are produced at some particular value of the mass they can accrete if they are in a mini cluster and they can grow in mass and at some point they, they can reach this critical mass and uh, be, uh, if they continue to accrete they become super critical then self interactions are very important and then they trigger a collapse into an axiton essentially they will just fall here they will radiate some relativistic accents and then will come back into the dilute uh, axon uh, star branch and this is very interesting because uh, if axon dark matter has sufficient of these dilute axon stars uh, they can you can change some non-relativistic to some relativistic axioms and change eff effectively the equation of state. And also um, during, this uh, during this axitonic uh, evolution, this ax these um, uh, axion stars can coherently decay into radio waves. So they could pr can produce a, a visible uh, signature of this scenario. Uh, and the third aspect of um, of our, uh, so the third substructure of uh, relevance in the axon dark matter scenario are mini clusters, which are gravitational bounds of uh, axon dark matter. And these are much larger objects, of, uh, but still small compared with uh, dark matter halos, perhaps 10 to the minus 12 solar masses, a large density compared with the dark matter density, uh, for instance, of, of the galaxy. And these objects uh, can have enough or can have large mass uh, so that one can have micro or it, uh, even femtolensing uh, signatures. Uh, but it's very sad that uh, if, if most of the action dark matter lies into these very compact objects, actually they, they can hide dark matter to direct detection experiments. And this, as we will see, this is one of the things that we find that uh, almost 80% of the dark matter density uh, in the universe is in the form of uh, relatively compact mini clusters so that uh, we will not so uh, in uh, on earth we will not have access to these mini clusters because the typical encounter rate uh, of, of the earth with one of these mini clusters is very long is very long it's 10 to the five years or so or so so we will have to be content with a small 20 percent of the dark matter uh, here uh, or with some uh, relatively rare event in which we would just cross a mini cluster or a tidal stream of mini clusters so this, uh, this first exposition of the dark matter substructure uh, asks for some, or mm, yeah, asks us to 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 add some uh, to answer some quantitative uh, issues, right? So what, what is the mini cluster mass function? So how many mini clusters can we have uh, per unit mass? How are the mini cluster density profiles to to study micro lensing and so on? Uh, and then what, are, what is the dilute uh, action star mass function and what is the rate of action dark, uh, so dilute action star collapse. So to study the, the consequences I told you before. And in order to answer all these questions, we need to, to know the distribution of, of action dark matter at, uh, at the smallest scales uh, before, uh, uh, radiation, uh, before matter radiation equality. Okay, and this has been attempted to be answered qualitatively by uh, numerical simulations in uh, our work and also the work of Sabdi et al. or Bushman et al. Uh, couple, uh, well, well, last year. Uh, so this is and this is the starting point. So first we need to know the distribution of action dark matter. Then we have to simulate the gravitational collapse, and then um, which has been done also and presented this year in a paper in a PRL with Egemeyer et al. And uh, we need to. Um, then if we want to, to do uh, dilute action star physics, we need even more simulations, okay? Which had been started to do, but actually in order to study the, the formation of action, uh, so of dilute action stars, we need to know the distribution and we need to uh, do simulations of formation of these action stars. And uh, what, so far what we know is that they form uh, with some large, uh, in some cases in action mini clusters. Uh, this has been done recently. And uh, also they can collapse uh, if the action coupling to photons is relatively large. So we have some pre uh, work here, but still no information about the uh, mass function of these objects. 
So how do we uh, investigate the distribution of action dark matter? Uh, it has been already uh, introduced by Jordi, but let me just go very fast. So uh, the very early analytical uh, attempts or numerical effect attempts were in vain, I think, because the initial spectrum of axions uh, were, was put by hand. Uh, so they didn't just take into account the, the network of, of cosmic strings. So this, uh, they didn't provide uh, 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 the spectrum as an output, but just uh, as, as a consequence of their input. Um, so the, the right way to do it is just to uh, do numerical simulations of uh, the global cosmic string network. And the easiest way of doing, uh, of doing so is just to consider the evolution of a, a complex scalar field uh, <clears throat> whose uh, angular part is the acuity axion. And it has a small tilt that depends on the axion mass, as you can see here. So this would be theta equals zero theta equals pi is slightly tilted. So, and this can be done in Cartesian grids. So this is the simplest thing to do and we can do it very well and we can put it in huge clusters. So we can just put a lot of points. Uh, and uh, so we have created a code to, to do this exercise uh, very optima, uh, optimally. So this is our Jackson's code that is publicly available where we can just go up to grids of uh, essentially 10 to the four uh, points in each direction. So this allows us to, to give, to have a, a huge separation of scales or the huge, as huge as, as possible, separation of scales between the cosmic string core and the uh, horizon. And what you see here is a snap, is a, is a, a, a snapshot or four snapshots of our simulations. And what you see the scaling regime. Uh, so in which the, the length, so distance within scale of strings is increasing proportionally to cost, uh, to conformal time or to a scale factor time. And uh, here you see how uh, domain walls, uh, which are bounded by cosmic strings are uh, dragging the, the cosmic strings to destruction. And then here you see the final action dark matter distribution almost frozen with the presence of some accidents. So let me just uh, skip some uh, technicalities. I want to show you a movie. <clears throat> I think I'm not faring very well uh, in time. But we should have uh, time to see this, which is the evolution of the cosmic network. So this is a projection map uh, of the of the axion energy. So you see that most of the energy, or the most uh, most of the energy, is localized around the string cores, actually. But you see that uh, as uh, the strings are collapsing uh, in loops and, and getting destroyed, uh, some axons are emitted, and these axons, uh, yeah, they diffuse but they still have some substructure. There you see also front waves and so on. And now the domain walls are just pulling the strings completely to disappear and producing the last uh, relativistic axions. As you see, these waves are very sharp. So they are going to diffuse uh, relatively long. And here you see also the production of the first uh, accidents, which have pr been produced in regions where uh, theta was already quite large at the beginning in the regions of large over density. And uh, so we have taken these simulations and studied the action, uh, also the dark matter power spectrum, which means that we just compute the, uh, the density of dark matter and then compute the fluctuations to uh, um, Fourier decomposition of the fluctuations and consider the power spectrum normalized like this. So this is the dimensionless var variance. And here you see the evolution uh, through the, throughout the simulation parameterized by uh, time uh, from the moment when a, the action uh, mass becomes effective, which is tau equals one. And what you see here is uh, early times, there's a <coughs> large contrast at uh, a large scales, so at very small scales. And this is due to the, to the cosmic strings, which have a lot of energy. And as time evolves, what you see here is that uh, <coughs> the coherence length, so here, the spectrum is a zero because just um, very uh, long modes are just suppressed by the fact that you have very, um, so this is, uh, this is longer than the correlation length. So there's a correlation length that is increasing in time. Uh, and as it increases, the power at uh, small scales can increase. Um, but when time becomes uh, of larger than order one, what you see is that at some point, the, uh, the last strings, they disappear. So the power spectrum at small scales disappears with the strings. And you see the appearance of one peak, which corresponds essentially to uh, the wave number equal to the axion mass. 
Okay, now this is due to the fact that um, you have domain walls and you have accidents, and the, the physical length associated with domain walls is uh, the, the axial mass. And you see that also the coherence length has, has become frozen here. So the accents are not free streaming uh, anymore. Uh, this is because they have become non relativistic. So they, they, this will not move to the left. Happy. Um, I'm going to have to stop you soon so that we can take some questions. Very good. So then I'll, I'll uh, go very fast, uh, perhaps one minute. So, and then what you see is that this peak goes up. This is due to the accidents. Uh, but these accidents, uh, we think that <clears throat> they are not going to be very relevant at late times. So we, we can actually uh, diffuse them away and uh, we can get rid of them by just uh, allowing the field to uh, evolve linearly. So at the end, we get a power spectrum, which almost has fluctuations of order one and white noise at low frequencies and uh, some tail at high frequencies. <clears throat> then we can just put this uh, final density for stream it until matter is in equality. And since the wavelength of accents is very small at uh, uh, radiation equality, matter radiation equality, uh, we can just sample the density with particles and then study the evolution of, uh, of the dark matter in, in using an embody simulation uh, that you can see, for instance, here. Uh, and you see that the gravitational formation of uh, mini clusters, which uh, is very similar to the uh, um, formation of uh, dark matter halos in um, standard lambda, lambda cold dark matter. And you see how the halos are forming from the smallest scales to the largest scales as well. So that mini clusters actually form out of uh, much smaller mini clusters in a sense. So we have studied a very large simulation to have uh, very nice statistics. And uh, in this paper, in this uh, recent PRL, and we have found uh, the um, halo mass function, the mini cluster halo mass function, which is depicted here. Very interesting because there's a lot, there are lots of low mass mini clusters that had not been previously uh, predicted. Uh, and um, the typical mini cluster with uh, over density, so average over density of order one has uh, 10 to the minus 11 solar masses. And there are also some classes of mini clusters with smaller over density. And the density profiles we have found to be, to be uh, NFW. And the most interesting perhaps is the bound, bound fraction. So the fraction of, of accents that are bounded in these mini clusters turns out to be to approach with redshift uh, to, to a, fra a fraction of eight, 80%. So this is very large and it leaves very small room for accents. Uh, so well, it leaves this 20% for the direct detection in principle. So the, this is a very strong, this has very strong implications for microlensing. Um, I think David has already uh, told, uh, told us so, because what we find is that the, the NFW scale ratio is, uh, is relatively large. So the, the mini clusters uh, that could do microlensing uh, in, uh, for instance, in the HSC survey of, uh, of uh, Andromeda, so masses of 10 to the minus 11, so they turn out to be quite fluffy. So the, the scale radius of these mini clusters is, is larger than the scale uh, that, that the Einstein, Einstein radius for the typical mini cluster. So actually there are no bounds from microlensing at the moment. And uh, yeah, so I just, before concluding, I just wanted to tell you, of course, all these results have been obtained with our simulations, which are very naive and they, they are done with uh, relatively, uh, uh, small small tension strings. Uh, however, so there, there have been some, uh, recent developments in the in the field of uh, <coughs> uh, simulating axon dark matter, and uh, and uh, perhaps I have to go very fast over this. But we have we are testing how these new developments, in particular the attractor um, solution that uh, Dottie told you about on Monday is Tuesday. We are testing how these uh, new ways of, of calculating the spectrum of, of, of accents will affect the density of dark matter. And so I have some preliminary results. If you are interested, I can comment them in the, in the questions. Uh, but let me just go to my conclusions. I think uh, the axon dark matter substructure offers uh, these uh, very interesting smoking guns to discover axions, uh, but we need to understand quantitatively the power spectrum and we need to do these uh, numerical simulations. So I've uh, presented you very fast, uh, uh, first simulations with the fluffy strings that we can simulate directly. 
and we are exploring the implications of uh, refinements of these uh, of these simulations. And uh, with this, I, I think I should stop. Sorry, Dodi, for the for jumping too much over time. Thanks, Javi. Um, I think I'm just going to read. Um, there were quite a few questions in the chat, but happily, uh, Igor Igor managed to answer a few of them in text already. Um, so there's just one question left. Thank you, Igor. Um, which is from uh, Subinoy. Um, and Subinoy asks, um, ca uh, can the, the dense um, mini clusters, or I suppose dense, um, axion stars in their centers, uh, radiate photons due to the axion photon coupling? So the, the answer is yes. And uh, they, they will do so. Uh, typically, the, I think the estimates are that for the typical values of the axion, the QCD axion coupling to photons, this uh, radiation is, is uh, relatively faint. Um, <clears throat> so it's very hard to detect. If the coupling to photons is an abnormally large, and there are models in which you can have this, then you could have a, a sizable signal. You could, in principle, have uh, um, parametric self-destruction, uh, parametric decay into, into photons. This has been studied uh, by Kachev uh, many years ago. And uh, I, uh, I think this year, uh, Kachev provided the first simulations of a uh, Bosa star actually being disrupted uh, into radio radio photons, very interesting. But this requires uh, coupling to photons 100 times larger than the typical QCD value. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Harvey. Um